535. And with that, I think that we should get started. So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for signing up for the PAGE Backyard Grower Series. This series is put on by the Coconino County Cooperative Extension. Um, our main office is in Flagstaff, but um, we serve all of Coconino County. Um, another part of this class that I should mention is put on by the Master Gardener Program. And uh, we have a few master gardeners in the room tonight. So welcome everybody. Um, before we get started, before I introduce our guest speaker and we get started with the class, I just want to introduce myself to you. I've um, emailed with all of you, um, but uh, we haven't met yet. I do know some of you because I do have a slight page connection. My Boyfriend lived in Page for many years and his grandparents moved there in the 70s to work at the plant. Um, so I do know a few of you in the room. My name's Gail Gradup. Um, I'm an instructional specialist coordinator um, with the U of A Cooperative Extension. I've been um, here in Coconino County for um, 25 years between spending most of my time between Flagstaff and Grand Canyon. Um, my educational background is I have a, uh, environmental studies, bachelor's degree from NAU, but um, I kind of switched gears and went back to school for horticulture. So I also have a degree in horticulture and I just um, got my master's in ag ed from the U of A last August. I'm really glad that's over with. Um, for um, the past 15 years here in Northern Arizona, I've been um, working with mostly native plants. Um, I was the grower and greenhouse manager at the Arboretum at Flagstaff. I worked there for um, about six or seven years. And um, I also worked in the vegetation program for the National Park Service at Grand Canyon. So that's my background. That's enough about me. Um, before we get started, I also just kind of want to go over some housekeeping, some general housekeeping. Um, so the way that the classes are going to work, um, we have a series as you're all aware of, but we're gonna, um, some of the classes are gonna be taught by um, me, but we've also, I've also brought in um, some guest speakers. And uh, what I'm really excited about is that we have some page locals that are going to be helping to teach the series. So tonight we have um, Danielle Stewart. Um, she's gonna be teaching the uh, planning your garden portion of the class. Next week on February 24th, I'll be teaching um, the seed starting and plant care class. March 3rd, um, I'll also be teaching the soils and composting class. And then on March 10th, we have the uh, Coconino County Cooperative Extension and Master Gardener Program Coordinator, Hattie Braun. She is gonna be teaching um, the pests and diseases class. And then we're gonna wrap up with the lovely Alyssa Jones, who is going to be talking about um, community supported agriculture. Alyssa is one of the master gardeners who got um, helped start the, the Page Farmers Market. So um, what we really wanna do with this series is um, teach people how to grow their vegetables and maybe eat, grow their own vegetables in their backyards and maybe even contribute to the Page Farmers Market if, um, that happens again this summer, who knows, with COVID, Melissa might have more insight on that, but we'll visit that um, on March 17th. Um, other things to bring up, uh, the link. So the way that I've set this class up, the link that you were sent will get you into each of the classes in the series. So don't lose that link is basically <laughs> what I wanna say. So pin it up somewhere in your inbox, flag it, do whatever you need to do um, because that link is unique to you and it will be your key to get into all of the classes. Um, the sessions are going to be recorded and um, I'm going to post them on our YouTube channel the following day. Um, it'd be really great if everybody just came to class, but I understand, you know, life happens and you might not be able to come to every class or you might not even want to. Um, since this is a 
not non per credit class and we're all adults you do your own thing but we really want to build community and page and that's the point of doing this zoom class live as opposed to just recording presentations and posting them up on youtube but with that said um i will send everybody the link to our youtube channel so you just know where to find the videos if you do miss class we have a relatively small-ish class. Um, we've got 33 people signed up. So it's going to be, which is really nice. It, it'll be quaint and um, smaller. So we're gonna leave lots of room for questions. And with this number of people, what we can do is we can, um, I'm just gonna have you guys unmute yourselves if you have questions to ask the speaker. If that starts to get a little bit crazy, then um, we can just put questions in, in the chat box. Um, and then just a reminder to mute yourself otherwise, because we don't wanna pick up a bunch of feedback. And with that, I am finished. So I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for tonight. Um, Danielle Stewart has been a Coconino County Master Gardener in Page since 2016. Currently, she's the manager of Red's Ace in Page, and previously she was the garden center manager. She has a lot of experience teaching gardening classes around Page, and um, she answers a lot of gardening questions at her job. She's taught to um, the Girl Scouts and um, the National Park Service at um, Lake Powell. So with that, Danielle, I will have you take it away. Awesome. Hi guys, it's super exciting to be a part of this. Um, also exciting, I see some of my customers in here. <laughs> like nice to see some familiar faces. Um, I am, yeah, really excited to be joining us, but I've been a page resident here since 95. Um, my family moved here back then, so I've been here a little over 20 years. Not all of those years were in Page, but most of them have been. Um, but yeah, five of, of those years were spent managing the Garden Center, which has brought me a ton of information. But that Master Gardeners class, of course, was awesome, and I highly recommend it to everybody. Um, but yeah, let's get started on planning your garden. So I wanted to start with some of the basics here for the page area, especially if you're new um, to planting in general. So uh, one question that is really important to know is what zone you are in. So uh, when I say zone, a lot of the plants that you purchase, I've got a tag here, for example, a couple of them, um, will give you a list on the back and I'm gonna try and show this to you as best as possible and hope that maybe it'll almost, maybe, there we go. All right, and so zones here, you can see some of them give you a little bit of a range of zones. Um, a lot of times they'll just give you a single number, but what does that mean? So we are zone 8B, and what that tells us is what our average extreme minimum temperature is for our area. So especially when we're selecting plants that we want to be perennial to last until the next season, um, you know, that's something to take into consideration is just how cold can those plants uh, make it here. And so that 8B basically means that our lowest temperatures get down between 15 and 20 degrees. Um, if you're from not necessarily the page area, but from nearby, it's really easy to find that information online. Um, but yeah, to find the best selection of plants for your area, it's really important to know what zone you're in. All right, um, the second thing, just kind of another basic is our average last frost date, um, especially because I'm, you know, we're focusing on vegetable gardening in particular for this class. Um, it's really important to know when it's safe to put your plants outside uh, because most of our vegetable varieties, of course, really hate that cold frost. Um, so for our area here in Page, that average last frost date is right around April 20th. Um, so I usually, as you know, coming from the garden center perspective, I usually don't start ordering our vegetable starts and things until right around Easter time. 
um, in anticipation of that last frost date. And so with that, um, that also gives us our growing season. So the growing season in page is anywhere between 91 and about 120 days. So that's days of frost free weather estimated. Um, of course, some people will start by seed, which of course I highly recommend, especially if you are planning on planting in bulk. Um, you know, seeds is a great way to um, you know, kind of save your pennies and, and get a lot of really good quality plants. I'm personally a terrible seed starter. Um, I prefer to go by starts, but it's because I'm a little bit neglectful. Seeds take a lot of babying and I'm not great at that, but I give props to my seed starters in here because that takes a lot of patience and, and uh, a lot of time and effort to make sure those are just the right level of wet and sunshine and all of that. Um, so yeah, speaking of that average last frost, uh, something kind of fun that I hear all the time in the garden center especially is, oh, uh, when the snow is gone from Navajo Mountain, that's when you can, it's safe to plant outside. And um, it's kind of cute, honestly, you know, of course it's a fun like, oh yeah, that's an easy way to remember. Um, but that is not always accurate. <laughs> So I always try and encourage people to, you know, really look up and research what the actual last frost date is for our area, because that has bitten us in the past before where I've had customers come in, yeah, the snow is gone, the snow is gone, let's plant. And then we get a winter storm and guess what? The snow is back on Navajo Mountain. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's fun little folklore uh, to share. And a lot of years it has been correct, but. Um, of course, I encourage people to go off of that recommended last frost date before they trust uh, snow on the mountain. All right, so that's kind of our weather slash area basics. Um, another thing that's really important is to touch on our soil here, um, which I'm sure a lot of you will laugh. Well, what soil? We have sand. We don't have soil or we have rock. Um, which of course a lot of people unfortunately are stuck either in an area where it's typically blow sand or if you're on the plateau uh, some of us just have really rocky places. I've had a lot of people come and talk to me about how they would love to do a garden but they've only got about this much soil and then it's just rock underneath. Um, happens a lot, totally okay. We're going to talk about how to work around those. Um, but if you are fortunate enough to have soil, um, myself in particular, I have a sandy blend of soil in my yard, um, but the pH level is something that's very important to take into account when you are getting ready to start your vegetable garden. So the pH general standard around page for us, and, and that, uh, sorry, let me dive into that a little bit too, um, is the level of acidity in your soil. So your acidity is determined a lot of times by how much organic material you have in the soil, how rich it is, um, which there's a lot of ways to tweak that. But the, the native soil here is usually right between an eight and a nine on a, the pH level. So very alkaline. Um, the lower the pH, the more acidic the soil, the higher uh, the number, the more alkaline the soil. So most vegetable varieties like a pH of about six. So that tells you kind of how far we are naturally out of that happy range of pH for most vegetable varieties. Um, so our soil, to say the least, if you have soil even, needs a lot of love. So those are just the basics as far as weather, zone, and soil. So let's dive in a little bit deeper. And I do have kind of a little, I'm, I was just telling Gail, I'm the worst millennial ever. <laughs> I, I uh, was gonna do a PowerPoint, but I, I have terrible, um, I don't have a great laptop, my computer is old. Um, so I actually created just some, some bullet points. If you guys are on a phone, if you wanna screenshot it, that's great. But I'm sure Gail can also, um, add, I sent her the Word document that I created for this class. I'm sure she could add that to the email if anybody wants sort of the bullet points of tonight. All right, so here we go. So step one uh, for planning your garden, location, location, location. 
um, is finding the perfect spot in your yard that's going to have the best combination of things to make your garden prosper. Um, so with choosing your location, there are certain things that you definitely want to avoid when you're choosing your spot for your garden. Um, some of these things include um, large trees and shrubs. Now, of course, uh, they provide shade, which can be great in the right circumstance, but also, especially if you're planting in the ground, um, you're gonna have to take into account the root systems that are gonna be underneath there. Um, and so roots of other plants, when you're trying to plant a vegetable garden are harmful in that they're stealing nutrients and stealing water from your vegetable garden. Um, I've known folks to do raised beds, but with open bottoms underneath um, trees in an effort to, you know, kind of stay above the roots, but they actually had the tree roots grow up into the raised beds because roots follow water, they follow nutrients. So um, if you do, if you unfortunately just have to plant close to a tree or a large shrub of some kind, um, it's super beneficial to have something with a bottom which will go into containers and things also a little later. Um, other things to avoid would be planting in too much sun or too much shade. Um, of course, being in Arizona, it's great because we have lots of sunshine, but too much sunshine can be a bad thing, um, especially with some of our tender vegetables um, varieties, such as your leaf lettuces, um, you know, broccolis, cauliflowers, which are, are more cool season vegetables. Um, you know, things that are going to react poorly to too much sun and potentially burn. Um, also too much shade. Of course, there are varieties that you can plant if you're just, you know, you're like, Danielle, this is what I've been dealt. I've got kind of a shady garden area. That's okay. There's tons of stuff that you can still plant in shaded areas. Um, and we can go into that a little bit later as well. Um, other things to avoid would be, of course, planting in hard clay, rocky or very sandy soil. Um, around here, tons and tons of amendment is necessary. Um, how deep, as far as amendment goes, say if you are unfortunately stuck with sandy or rocky soil, um, I recommend uh, digging down at least a foot and adding as much organic material as you can, compost, um, peat moss is a great thing to have around here, uh, especially with water retention and dropping your acidity levels down. Um, anything that you can add in there. Um, there's a lot of people are going to do their own, own compost, which we'll go into at a later class. But uh, yeah, as much organic more t uh, material compost as you can add is always great. Garden soil blends um, and at least a foot down for most varieties. All right, so another thing to avoid is planting in areas exposed to a lot of wind. Um, that is something that, of course, the page area is kind of known for, especially in spring, of course, when you've got your babies coming up and you're so excited and then in comes the April, you know, March wind season. Not fun at all, um, which, of course, there are simple solutions to those as well. So going into those solutions, um, of course, would be to build structures. Uh, it's really awesome to do um, shade fabrics, uh, any which also provide a great windbreak. Uh, personally, for my garden, I have my garden fenced off with a nice lattice fencing. But um, when the sun starts to just get to be too much, um, at most of your local hardware stores, Walmart, you can get a shade fabric to kind of help protect those plants in the hot heat of the day, as well as from uh, wind damage. And so that's a great thing to do. Um, choosing a location with six to eight hours of sunlight. So most of your vegetable varieties are gonna want at least six to eight hours. Uh, here in our area, east, east facing is always best if possible, getting that morning sun. And reason being is once, you know, after that 12 o'clock hour, it starts getting into one, two, three o'clock, you're gonna be getting some really intense heat. And most of our vegetable varieties are really not gonna like that. Um, I mean, if you can limit as much of that late afternoon sun as you can, it would be preferable. 
Um, a lot of people have north facing gardens, which it's a lot of shade. Um, and again, that's okay if you have north facing where you know you're you just don't have the sunlight to offer. Um, I always recommend there's tons of great uh, varieties for those shaded areas. Um, your south side is going to be lots and lots of sun. So you're going to really want to look into some kind of protection. And then in your west facing side, again, you're going to get a lot of that afternoon sun. So um, a great way to monitor that and uh, kind of feel out which area is going to be best for your garden. Um, Gail already kind of mentioned it in the chat, but building up doing pots, potted plants. A lot of people here do uh, potted vegetable gardens, which is great. Um, most of my garden is actually in just large plastic pots. And the great thing about a potted vegetable garden is you can move it. Uh, if you've got an item that's getting just way too much sun, you can see that it's burning, you can see that it's suffering, you can always shuffle that around to really find where it's going to be the happiest. And then uh, another great thing with that, um, with raised beds or containers, um, you can use certain taller varieties to shade other plants that are gonna be more sensitive to that sunlight. Um, so, I mean, uh, companion planting is something that I really highly recommend when you're planning your garden. Um, of course, you want to map out the space and make sure you're not overcrowding, um, but we'll go into that a little bit later as well. Um, but yeah, great, a great thing to do uh, is set up some of your larger plants that are going to like the most sun varieties like tomatoes and peppers, which grow excellent here. Um, setting those up to where they're going to take the brunt of that afternoon sun. Um, and then you can shade your more sensitive varieties, your leaf lettuces. Um, strawberries are a great thing that grow out here and are perennial, which is excellent, which means they come back every year. Um, I'll just touch on that real quick. I, I, I get a lot of questions on the annual versus perennial. So annual are the items that you have to replant every year. They don't make it through our frost season. Perennial are varieties that last through our winter. They usually go through a dormancy period and then they come back in the spring. There are a lot of great perennial vegetable items that grow here in the page area. Strawberries being one of them, asparagus being one of them, artichoke being one of them, um, really awesome varieties that you can plant and reap the benefits of for years. Potatoes, um, onions, garlic, great things that you can plant if you want a year round garden, things that you can harvest all year round. All right, two, two, two. All right, so number two on my step two, I'm trying to follow my bullet points here. I tend to rabbit trail a lot, so I apologize if I start to ramble a little bit, but it's exciting. I love this stuff, so I'm really excited to talk about it. Um, number two, of course, is planning the layout of your garden, and that's where uh, what I talked about earlier about planning. Well, maybe I'll put my taller plants up where they're going to get the worst of the afternoon sun. Corn, of course, corn grows great here as well. Um, I've actually had some success with that here even in my backyard. Um, so you don't need a huge field. You do need a lot when it comes to corn, but uh, items like that that are gonna get tall are great sources of shade. Um, one thing that is a really popular um, companion planting model is they call it the three sisters, which grow great here in Page. Um, and so that is your corn, your green beans, and your, your squash or your zucchini along the base. And so um, I have some great charts. In fact, I'm, I'm probably gonna see if I can get that to Gail on companion planting to give you guys some, some tips on what grows well together, what doesn't grow well together, because there are definitely planting enemies out there as well when it comes to vegetable gardening. But um, yeah, making sure that you have your layout planned for your placement is really key. Um, one common mistake with your garden plant placement is people tend to um, get these small plants from the garden center or they get their sprouts out 
and they just fill their garden with these cute little tiny plants, not taking into account that that little tomato is going to be four feet by three feet wide when it reaches maturity. So it's always kind of a sad start because you'll have this little teeny plant in all this space. But uh, and it's really important to take into account that these plants are going to grow. They're going to get big. You really want to avoid overcrowding when you're planning your garden, garden beds. Um, so, and that information should be on the tag of your items, assuming that you are buying starters, but also on your seed starts. Um, I obviously, I save my tags when I bring in a new item. Um, I like it because a lot of these, especially from some of these more name brand companies, like this is a Monrovia tag here, um, comes with not only great information about planting tips, and placement and care, but it also helps you with, um, with, oh, sorry, I just totally lost my train of thought. Uh, care over time, how do I prune this item? Um, you know, at what, about how long is it gonna take to reach maturity? So tomato varieties, especially, a lot of times when you check the tags, it'll give you how many days until that plant reaches maturity when you'll actually start to see uh, some produce. So that's something to take into account, making sure that you're not starting too late on certain items to where the plant's not gonna reach maturity by the time our frost hits. Um, so definitely uh, take that into consideration when you're planning out the layout. Um, one thing that I had added onto my little bullet point was you know to start slow with varieties that you'll actually eat items that you know that you use a lot of um, but you know I in part also take that back because I know how exciting it is to start a garden and if you do end up with just way more produce than you know how to do with we have an excellent um, farmer's market that Melissa and the city they have worked so hard on getting going so any of your extra vegetable produce that's a great place to showcase it to share it with our community um it's awesome i just know my first garden uh i went way gung-ho i got a whole bunch of vegetables i was just so excited and it became really overwhelming i started having problems i started having crowding issues and then i ended up with just way too much produce i my, my neighbors were thrilled. They were super happy. Lots of zucchini and tomatoes for everyone. Um, but, you know, really take into consideration, okay, what am I, how am I prepared to start? Am I prepared to start with this immaculate, you know, crazy complex garden? Or maybe I should just start with some tomatoes and peppers. Um, you know, maybe some zucchini, some of these easier varieties. So um, when you're planning out, really kind of take into account, like, what am I ready for? <laughs> All right, let's see. And to do, ah, one thing also, as you are going through this process, uh, garden journals are an excellent way to keep track of, oh, what worked for you, what didn't work for you. Um, I have tons of people that come in with opposite problems when they come and talk to me at the garden center um, with, hey, you know, I planted these tomatoes. They did terrible, I don't know what to do. And then their neighbor two houses down had beautiful tomatoes and tomatoes out their ears and everything was great. So, um, you know, I'm really hoping too through this class as we get to know each other, we can bounce ideas off of each other. What, what should I try differently? And, uh, you know, gardening in the desert is tough. It is tough trying to make things grow where very few things are meant to grow. So please be patient with yourself, especially and any way that you can document this down um, of your progress and varieties that you liked, varieties that you didn't like, um, you know, not documenting this, uh, you know, your progress through your garden has bitten me in the past where I found a tomato variety, I loved it, it did great for me. The next year, I couldn't for the life of me remember what it was called. I, I couldn't find it, had to start again, try a new one, so. Um, I absolutely recommend Garden Journal to anybody. And there's some really cute ones you can find online or you can do something as simple as a spiral notebook um, just to jot down those ideas. All right. 
Danielle, are you going to be recommending some varieties that do well in page as far as like tomatoes and peppers and what you found that works there? Absolutely. Yes. And that is actually perfectly brings me into my next uh, page, which is key ingredients for success. Um, so the first one is select varieties that grow well in your area. So perfect timing, Gail. Thank you. <laughs> um, of course, anything, any of our more heat tolerant um, vegetables, our summer, our summer vegetables are going to be the most recommended here just because our, our cool season, um, you know, it, it goes from harsh to hot real quick here, or harsh cold to hot really quick. So you, there's a real small window for your cool season veggies. Um, so, of course, your cool season are going to be your kale, your broccoli, your cauliflower, um, your spinaches. Those are things that are going to, you know, as soon as it gets hot, a lot of times they'll either bolt or um, just stop producing entirely. So, of course, I recommend doing those early. Um, but the best varieties for our area, we'll talk about tomatoes first. Um, there's a few, I call them garden center favorites. Um, most of them are going to be cherry tomatoes. I highly recommend starting with cherry tomatoes for your first tomato growing experience, uh, mainly because they're a lot easier. Um, just with those smaller fruit, it's a lot easier to get them matured. Um, it's a lot easier to get a higher volume. Uh, some of these cherry tomato varieties would be sweet 100s, um, yellow pear tomatoes, and then my personal favorite are going to be the sun sugar cherry tomatoes. They're a little orange cherry tomato. I don't even like tomatoes. I love the sun sugar cherry tomatoes. I grew them for my husband. And uh, I was like, you know, I'm putting all this effort in. I should try one. Love the sun sugars. Tons of flavor. If you like a meatier flavor, that yellow pear is great. Um, but with your larger... Uh, tomato varieties. A really popular one for us is heat wave tomato. Um, so those are kind of a mid-size as well as our uh, Phoenix tomatoes. Those are a particularly heat tolerant variety. And then 4th of July tomatoes are some excellent, more meaty, um, roundabout, good tomatoes. And Romas. I had excellent luck with Romas over the last year. Roma tomatoes is something, um, if I don't grow it personally, I usually end up with a bag of them on my porch from somebody because <laughs> I know a lot of folks around town here that grow them. Um, a lot of folks also like um, our heirloom tomato varieties. If that's you, props to you. I never have much luck with the heirloom varieties, um, but Moscow tomatoes is one that I've heard good things about with our heirlooms. Um, Early girls are, an, are a really popular tomato as well. Um, they're a, a bit smaller. They tend to come out earlier in the season, which is why people love them. Um, once you talk to Gail, or not Gail, I'm sorry, Gail, um, Hattie later on, Hattie, that was actually one of my favorite jokes is she just, Bleh! early girl tomatoes. She's like, I don't understand why anybody would want to plant early girls. They're terrible. If that's your flavor, that's your flavor. <laughs> but you if you're looking for every something- year. She plants every, every year. <laughs> See, and that's it. Is is and that's again. That's where your gardening uh, journal is going to be really handy dandy because that's where it's going to tell you. You know, I did not like those this year. I gave away way more than I ate. Why don't we go ahead and scratch those ones off the list for next year? Um, peppers. Peppers are excellent out here, of course. Any with our hot weather and our low moisture content. Um, peppers do great. Um, last year, I heard a lot of struggles with peppers. We had a really unusually wet spring, um, which I'm going to go into that a little bit more as far as moisture levels go. But um, jalapeno peppers, of course, um, are a really, really popular one. I said I we sell those by the flat, which a flat for us is 25 plants. So I mean, people will just come in and clear out the jalapenos really quickly. Um, another really popular one, especially if, ooh, Melissa, I'm going to touch on that real quick. My peppers had brown spots. 
All right, so peppers as well as tomatoes are susceptible to something called a blossom end rot. And I know this is probably tiptoeing into somebody else's presentation, but this is like my number one question was tomatoes and peppers. Um, blossom end rot has to do with a calcium deficiency in your soil. So a great way to remedy that, um, if you like the more organic gardening method, I use eggshells from my chicken eggs. I have chickens as well, I have backyard chickens. And I save my shells and every year I grind them down into a fine powder. And especially with my tomatoes, I mix a lot of that in the soil. Um, there are, um, yes, and chicken manure is another great thing to keep on standby for your garden. But um, there are calcium treatments at your local, of course, I'm gonna say Ace because I work there, but they have it at Walmart too. So, um, you know, any, any kind of a calcium supplement you can get your, for your plants will drastically change those brown spots on both your tomatoes and your peppers. Um, yeah, awesome question, Melissa. Thank you for, for hopping in there with that. Um, do, do, would you do this to prevent or just, I would do it from the very beginning. I didn't quite see the end of that message so we can touch on it later but it's a great preventative method. Even if you start to, even if you did this and you're still seeing the brown spots, um, of course, read your, read your directions. Please read your directions when you're adding any kind of a, a supplement to your garden. But um, it's something that you can add throughout the growing season. Um, it's, it's just calcium, it's very natural. It's really hard to overdo it on the calcium. Um, but of course you don't want to damage your roots either with too much calcium. So I'm going to start rabbit trailing if I go too far into that, but, um, yes, uneven watering. Yes. Awesome. Um, so yeah, more in detail with those, I'm happy to answer questions on, um, two, two, two. all right. So pepper varieties, honestly, really any kind of pepper variety, bell peppers do well here. Um, we get some sweet varieties as well that do really well here. I tried poblanos this last year. They did really well. Um, my husband is a spicy pepper guy. And so, um, you know, any of your hot varieties, but something to remember uh, starting from seed, especially with your hot, um, hot peppers is the hotter the pepper, the harder it is usually to germinate them. You tend to get less plants that way. So I usually recommend to start with um, starts if you're gonna go into the real hot, crazy peppers, um, just cause it's nice when somebody's already done that work for you and gotten them sprouted. Um, another popular thing that grows great here is really any and all squash varieties. Yellow crookneck squash, black beauty zucchini, 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 sorry. Um, I did this year for the first time, a really awesome variety called Kushaw squash. Um, it's also known as like an Indian squash. It's really popular in soups. It's a large squash with a, a light flesh. Um, I had a ton of Kushaw squash, really excellent. Um, butternut squash, I've personally struggled with a little bit, but I've got tons of customers that do great. So if that's you, you're awesome. Um, and then, and that's another thing guys is, is you know, everybody's going to have that one thing that they struggle with, but always keep trying, you know, some years are harder on certain varieties than others. Um, so I always encourage people to, you know, try it again. Maybe this year will be your year. You'll find that right recipe for the soil, sun, water, and uh, you'll do great. Uh, lavender is my Achilles heel. I can't grow lavender to save my life, which is funny because it's a great drought tolerant, sun loving perennial, but lavender doesn't like me. So I continue to try and try again. Um, yeah, your squash varieties are excellent. Uh, um, another great one would be uh, tomatillos. I get a lot of customers that like to do green salsas and things of that sort. Um, eggplant. Eggplant is a really popular one that we get asked for um, at the garden center, of course. Um, Black Beauty and Little Finger are probably my most common asked for varieties that seem to do really well here. Um, I'm going through my head, my aisles. Um, yeah, sorry, Black Beauty, and what was the other variety of eggplant? Little, Little Finger. finger. Um, they're a more narrow, 
um, or ladies fingers, I've heard them called as well. Um, they're a little bit of a smaller eggplant, but they do really well here. Um, um, if you're a root vegetable person, carrots. I've got a lot of people that do well with carrots. Um, that's something that I definitely recommend um, planting in bulk for sure, because you tend to lose some along the way. Um, melons, uh, cantaloupe does really well here. Um, one really awesome thing to try, which I did this year for the first time, because I had kind of struggled with watermelon cantaloupe varieties, is using mounds. Um, I had done my own compost and it wasn't great, I'll be honest. Um, I wasn't very attentive to it, but I had just this huge pile of compost. So what I did is I, I created two large hills in my little garden area. And that's where I did my melons this year. And I did great with both watermelon and cantaloupe. Um, so, you know, they really like a consistent moisture, but they don't like to be, they don't like their feet wet is what I, what I call it. They don't like to be in really damp soil for long periods of time. Um, so that's where the mound really kind of helps because it waters, but they don't sit in water. Um, so that's a great thing to keep in mind with your melon varieties in particular. Mm, I think that covered most of the most common varieties. Um, of course, even though I'm not out in the garden center anymore, um, I'm happy to answer questions inside the store. Um, and then we have another great master gardener who is out in the garden center now, uh, Kat Brown, super knowledgeable. She can help as well. And any, any local garden center really. Um, talk to the staff, see what other customers are, are asking about. Um, and that's a great place to start. All right, so those are some of our most popular varieties. Does anybody have any particular variety on the top of their head that they'd like to ask about before I move on from that? Danielle, do you care if I say a few others? Oh, please, yeah, Alyssa. Um, so I think, you know, what Danielle was saying, like with some of the smaller ones of any plants, I think have done really well for me and Paige. So some of like the, um, like the Asian eggplants, the longer, skinnier ones, Chinese eggplants, those have done well. I think probably that's like little finger and similar ones to those. And a lot of the smaller um, tomatoes, like what she was saying, um, Mexican midgets are like even tinier than uh, cherry tomatoes and they do awesome around here. Um, but yeah, a lot of varieties, I did like the smaller versions of things and it seemed like that tolerated the heat better. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you so much, Alyssa. And one really popular question while I'm still on the subject of these vegetables is, um, you know, making sure you have the right quantities in certain veggies. Um, items like uh, tomatoes are awesome because they are self-pollinating. Um, so of course, you know, the bees, you still need that pollen transfer, but you don't need multiple varieties to get tomatoes. Um, one important trick that I will tell you with tomatoes is once tomatoes reach a temperature above 98 degrees, I believe, uh, tomato pollen tends to go sterile once it gets too hot. So one of my popular questions is, Danielle, I have these beautiful tomato plants. They've got tons of flowers, but I have no tomatoes. What's going on? Um, I would really check to see if maybe they're just getting a little too hot in the afternoon. Um, see if you can kind of put them uh, where they are, can stay below that 98 degrees. Um, if you have problems with um, pollinators, uh, there's great ways you can do that yourself. I actually had posted a video. There's a little local um, garden group on Facebook. Um, perhaps we can find that. I think it's growing together in page AZ. Um, that, of course, we've got great locals talking about problems, talking about successes that we can all kind of hop in on, which is great. But um, with like squash varieties, so there's no male or female plant with squash varieties, but there are male and female blossoms. Um, so it's always nice to plant those in groups to give yourself a 
higher chance of having both male and female blossoms open at the same time um, because that's where the pollination happens. That's another popular one. I've got great zucchini. I've got great yellow squash. I've got tons of blossoms, but I'm not getting any fruit. Well, do you have male flowers open or do you have female flowers open? And your female flowers, you'll actually see the little baby fruit right behind the blossom um, where you're potentially going to have a zucchini or a squash. The male flowers, it's just a straight stem and a flower. Um, so those you can pollinate yourself. I do because, you know, I love the bees and everything, but I'd rather be guaranteed my squash. Um, so a lot of times I'll pick those male blossoms and I'll just swish them around in the female blossoms to try and really ensure they get pollinated. Um, and those squash blossoms are edible also. Um, a lot of people will fry those up and eat the blossoms when they're done. So um, yeah, more fun facts and tidbits, but uh, moving. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, we, um, we had a question in the chat box. And so mm -hmm. I'll um, ask you that. But before I do, I, I'll say that one thing that you can do to bring pollinators into your garden is interplant with pollinator plants. So um, just plant some annuals or perennials around your garden and um, that should attract our pollinator friends who we need in our gardens so we can get our fruit. Um, one question that was in the chat was, um, are there any other root vegetables that you recommend? Ooh, um, so interestingly enough, uh, it's not quite a vegetable, but uh, horseradish does excellent here. Um, horseradish is a good one. Um, potatoes, people have a ton of luck with the potatoes. And then beets. Um, I actually had one gentleman, interestingly enough, um, and this one, oh, I had a root. Oh my gosh, what was it? I think it was a, I, it had to have been a type of beet. I, I had a gentleman, he brought one in to me uh, at the garden center and he said, hey, I've got these all over my yard. Oh, yep, Alyssa, thank you. Um, that's another great example in the chat box there. Um, but they tend to be perennial. A lot of a lot of your root vegetables will kind of go dormant and then pop out. Um, your items such as uh, onions and garlic does well here. Um, there's a lot of great varieties um, that you can do with those. Um, radishes, I've had a couple people that say they did really great with radishes. I haven't tried them personally, but I've got about two or three locals here um, that had great luck with their radishes. So those are something. And honestly, guys, I, I would just experiment with them. If you have one you want to try, I mean, of course, read your packaging and, and you know, to figure out where it's going to be the most at home in your garden, if it maybe is going to need more shade or more sun. Um, but yeah, experiment. There's a great, uh, they call it the trash can method for potatoes that I actually experimented with the first time this year. And I did all right with it where you can plant a, your a potato starts in the very bottom of a trash can. And as the plant grows, you fill it with soil because of course those potatoes are springing out from roots. And um, I slowly filled up my trash can as the plant grew. And I ended up with a ton of potatoes actually, because um, as that plant grows up, as you fill up with soil, you're gonna get more roots from that main stem and you're gonna get a more likely uh, chance of getting more potatoes, essentially. Um, russet potatoes do well. Um, oh, uh, red potatoes is one that I get asked for all the time, as well as Yukon gold. Uh, Yukon gold are a great potato variety for our area here. Um, so all excellent questions, guys, thank you. And yeah, keep them coming as they pop up. Um, important with the pollinators, yes, like Gail said, you can always bring in some great um, flower varieties to attract your bees. I also know a lot of people in town that have backyard beehives. So that's something really cool. Um, there's a couple here that rescue um, bees. Oh, Tom and Penny Geiger. 
Geiger. Tom and Penny Geiger are our B people here in town. And whoop, do you bury or trim the potato? Sorry, I'm checking out that chat. Foliage as you add the soil. Oop, Tom no longer does these. Oh, bummer. I know he was working on teaching somebody, but hopefully we get another B person. But um, with the potatoes, I did not. I did not trim my leaves as I filled up with soil. Um, of course, if you're gonna if you're gonna trim your leaves back before you fill the soil, one thing I recommend is giving that opening a little time to heal before you put it under um, soil because a lot of times the moisture and um, different bacteria can get in through those open wounds on your potato plant and you can end up with a rotted potato. So um, you can absolutely remove leaves before you fill it up, but I would usually give it an hour or so before you actually fill it just to kind of give that wound some time to dry over. Um, okay, awesome. Uh, water. Of course, that is one of our biggest struggles here in the middle of nowhere desert is watering. Um, and the hard thing about it is, of course, you think it, we're in the desert, it needs tons and tons and tons of water. Well, depending on your soil, you may be drowning your plants as well. So that's something that's really important to kind of journal about and monitor your plants um, sort of body language, if you will. Um, most of my gardeners here have the best success with two waterings a day. Um, and consistent moisture is best. I mean, of course, if you're anything like me, I tend to be a forgetful waterer. So I try and put as much as I can on a timed system. Um, which we're going to go into that at a later class, but uh, maintaining consistent moisture is really key for a lot of these vegetable varieties. Um, you really don't want to drown out your plants, which another great way to avoid that would be um, making sure that you have well draining soil. Um, so of course you don't want anything too compact. You want to make sure that the water passes through, your roots get a good drink, but that they're not sitting uh, with their feet wet. Um, tomato varieties in particular, a lot of people struggle with splitting tomatoes. And one, ca one cause of that, there can be a few things, is inconsistent water. Um, you know, your soil gets dry. Oh no, I forgot. You go in, you soak it. A lot of those fruits, they'll absorb that a little too quickly and you'll end up with some splitting. Hot weather and cold water can also result in those splits on your tomatoes. So, um, but really the best thing to do is just make sure there's not too big of a dry out time in between your waterings. So consistency is key with that. Um, fertility, a lot of people, ooh, chipmunk proof. I love this question. All right, so chipmunk proof, that is, honestly, I, I've known people to cage their varieties, um, there's not a whole lot that I know of variety wise that are safe from chipmunks. And um, that's another thing that you're gonna have to take into consideration too is, is our local creatures that are gonna want a piece of your garden. Chipmunks, rabbits, um, I highly recommend any kind of fencing you have. Uh, the chipmunks, I mean, you could try like a fake predator, a fake owl, something of sorts to try and keep those little boogers out but the chipmunks are really hard to keep out. <laughs> I wish I had some better uh, advice on that one, but any kind of fencing you can provide uh, to at least keep uh, some of the bigger critters out. Um, I have a lot of people whose pets get into their gardens, dogs, things of that sort. So it's nice to try and add any kind of protection that you can. Um, I, if anybody has any great chipmunk solutions though, please add it in here because I'd like to know as well. Um, yeah, yeah, the chipmunks can be a real pain. Um, if you wanted to do um, netting is a great way to protect um, some of your more cherished items that are getting chipmunk attacked from both chipmunks and birds. Um, but one thing to keep in mind with the netting is you can also accidentally capture some of these creature, uh, creatures with the netting. I've heard that before. Um, pots. Not so much with the chipmunks, reason being there's not a whole lot that they can't get into. 
Um, I actually had my first customer last year. He had this one prize plant. He was trying to keep the rabbits out of it. He had a huge pot um, and he actually had put chicken wire netting in the pot and he said, I, you know, he was super excited. He thought for sure he'd outsmarted his rabbit. And he came out one morning with his cup of coffee and he looks in there and he's got his rabbit captured nicely in his uh, little pot. So some of those creatures are going to be really tricky to keep out, but um, I would recommend trying some netting. Um, they're still going to be able to get to some of the items that are, you know, right up against the net, but you'll likely be able to at least protect some of your inner fruits and veggies from those little creatures. So um, yeah, awesome questions, guys. Thank you. A uh, really important thing real quick also is fertility. I'm just gonna talk about that with, uh, with your soil nutrients. Um, so a lot of folks just, um, uh, you know, they, they amend their soil first thing in the year and then they just kind of let the garden go for the summer which some of the smaller varieties, you could probably get away with that, but items like tomatoes and peppers, um, you're gonna need to keep adding nutrients to the soil. Um, a lot of the soils that you purchase at the store, if they come with any kind of fertilizer, uh, the fertilizer only lasts maybe four, three or four months, um, which covers most of the growing season, but especially if you start noticing um, some of your vegetables starting to suffer, um, I always, at, you know, suggest adding um, a, a fertilizer of some type. And it doesn't have to be chemical. I know I've got a lot of organic gardeners here in town, which is awesome. Um, props to you. I suffered trying to keep things organic and I had a, uh, yeah, I had a hard time with that. So, but there's some great uh, vitamin supplements that you can get from the store that are natural um, to add into your soils. Um, and a lot of times your leaves will tell you exactly uh, what you need to add. Um, if you've got some really light neon green leaves, you probably need to add some nitrogen. Um, you can do that with bone meal um, or blood meal, I'm sorry, um, or maybe a steer manure or a chicken manure. Um, one thing I'll say with the manures, uh, chicken or, well, especially chicken or steer manure is to use it lightly. Um, those are what we call hot soils, reason being they are very high in nitrogen. Um, so adding too much of either one of the manure varieties uh, can result in burning, where you'll see the edges of your plant leaves start to turn brown. Um, so keep that in mind. Oh, I'm doing good on time. Yes. Okay. Um, so keep in mind that too much fertilizer, too much nutrients can be a bad thing. You can accidentally damage your plants. So if you're getting a, um, a fertilizer product that's like maybe in a granular or something, please read your, the directions very carefully. miracle Grow, um, miracle Grow actually, speaking of which, most gardeners, especially my organics, are like, ah, not miracle Grow. Um, but miracle Grow actually has an excellent um, product out. It is in a black um, casing, and it is an organic fertilizer that you can add to your garden. And one reason that I recommend it, especially for my organic garden gardeners, is it is OMRI certified. Um, so a lot of companies claim organic um, because a lot of um, chemicals and things are considered organic chemicals or, you know, um, but they aren't a true organic. Um, so if anybody is really, really concerned with staying with um, organic products, um, try and look up look for that OMRI certified seal, which will be on the product. Um, but we have a lot of great options for that as well. Um, all right. Yeah, my last, my last note was going to be uh, prepare, be prepared to defend your garden from pests and disease. Um, so with pests, especially, especially bugs, I get a lot of people, you know, I've got aphids now, where did they come from? Um, gnats, I get a lot of people that uh, struggle with ants. Um, hornworms, yes, my chickens love hornworms. That's probably my greatest bug control. Um, keep an eye out for them. Um, you know, there's a lot of great organic things that you can use to uh, prevent against that. Uh, one being neem oil. Um, there's a lot of great insecticidal soaps as well. Um, 
uh, that are, you know, a little more natural if you really want to avoid any kind of a chemical spray. Um, but neem oil is one of my favorite go-tos. It's what I use in the garden center to try and keep things as organic as possible for the folks that, you know, want to buy organic. Um, but depending on your problem, you know, there's a ton of uh, resources online, of course, but um, yeah, reach out to your community, reach out to your local master gardeners to see what works for them. Um, and I think for the most part, that's what I've got. But one thing, last thing, um, Gail was kind enough to attach this to the email. Um, it is a link to a really, really awesome resource for starting your first garden. So I highly recommend you guys print it out if you can. Um, and this is just 10 steps. A lot of what I talked about is in here and more in details, everything from, you know, garden layout, irrigation, um, tips and suggestions. But one thing that I wanted to touch on too with, uh, before we go here is a planting calendar for your varieties. Um, making sure that you're planting things in the right time of year. Are you gonna have enough time? Are you planting things too early, too late? Um, an awesome resource that is in this handout that is attached to the email um, is an actual schedule based on your elevation. Um, a lot of people, one thing that was mentioned when uh, we were meeting, uh, just preparing for this first class was a moon schedule as well, which was super intriguing to me because I've heard about it, but I've never tried it myself. So I'm sure Gail can touch on that as well. Um, but in this handout, I mean, it lists so many different vegetables here. Um, asparagus, basil, different types of beans, beet, cauliflower, chard, collard greens, um, kale, onions, peas, potatoes, everything. And it's so great here because based on your elevation, let's see if I can get that to, I don't know if it's focused, kind of, sort of, um, it gives you a date. So May, it gives you kind of a range uh, when to plant these things, when you can plant them and still get um, some production out of them. Um, one of my favorite, actually, this really helped me a lot. Um, I don't know if we have any Southerners. I married a Southerner, but okra. Okra does awesome here. I did an Annie Oakley okra. So I, I can see some of you are probably like, Ugh, nope, no thanks, slimy, gross. But, um, you know, there are some great varieties that it even suggests in here that you might want to try. Um, but it, it's just an awesome resource for figuring out the when of your planting. And if you're not from the Page area, it has several elevations worked out. Um, you know, if you're just from the nearby areas, um, it's awesome. So, and having that again added to your gardening journals is a great resource to have handy for the years to come. All right, do I have any questions? No, well, and, and if anything comes up, like I said, please feel free to reach out to Gail, reach out to myself as well. Um, this is what we love. So, I mean, uh, questions are always fun and exciting and um, I've learned a lot to, oop, I got one just trying to help other people with their dilemmas. Dilemmas, dilemmas. What's a good way to get lots of soil to start? Ooh, so are we talking, just to clarify, Victoria, like a, like a bulk soil? Are you thinking like a somewhere, like a source to get like a truckload of soil? Um, I'm just talking about like a home garden but I'm starting I, like from scratch. And so I don't want to spend hundreds of dollars on soil, especially because I might, you know, move to a different part of town or something. Right, absolutely. That's an excellent question. Um, honestly, a big solution to that would be um, container planting. Uh, the unfortunate truth of trying to plant in the native ground is that a lot of your good soil that you spend money on tends to, um, sort of be consumed by the sand and things here. Um, so I suggest doing containers. Um, raised beds is a great way uh, to do that. I, I did raised beds, mine are about 20 inches deep, um, but you can add a ton of inexpensive, just basic compost 
Um, unfortunately, there's nowhere here locally that you can buy buy like a truckload. Um, and then, ooh, I got some more good questions. Um, but uh, with the raised beds, it's nice because of course you still want um, that good drainage. So you can actually add in a lot of the sand here um, to give you that drainage. Um, uh, I usually recommend people use like a bag of play sand, which that is super inexpensive. It's like $4 for a big 50 pound bag um, to kind of keep things. But um, I suggest containers if you're trying to especially keep it, um, you know, on a budget. And if you're not really committed to where you're at right now, the great thing about your containers is you can take it with you. Um, okay. Let's see, what plants are not good to have near your garden? Um, I have personally experienced that sunflowers are really not great to have uh, near your vegetables because they drink a ton of water. Um, I recommend not planting near anything that drops a lot of seeds, um, you know, things that are gonna drop in and, and start up. Um, there's a, I, I'll have to attach it, I'll send it to Gail, but there's a great companion planting chart. Most of them you can actually find online that just tells you which items really don't vibe well together. Um, so there's some really great resources online for things that you don't want to uh, plant together. Uh, let's see. How often should you water your garden? That kind of depends on the time of year for me. Um, early spring, I can usually get away with once a day, but once summer hits, I recommend two waterings a day. If you're on a dripper system, you're going to kind of have to play that one by ear. If you've got a lot of wilty plants in the afternoon, you might want to do uh, a deeper water in the morning. Um, and of course, I don't recommend watering in the middle of the day. Uh, you just lose a lot of water to evaporation. And um, when your plants are hot, getting that cold water on there can both shock your plants. And I've heard people complain about burning on their leaves and those water droplets just, you know, get on the leaf in the middle of the day and almost make like a magnifying glass effect. Um, so yeah, the watering is something depending on your soil and your area, um, you'll have to kind of play by ear, but usually twice a day is the best a watering in the morning, watering in the evening, how deep that watering should be will kind of depend on your soil. Um, I'm from Tuba City. Is Tuba City different from Page or generally the same? It's very close, honestly. Uh, I think Tuba City actually gets a little colder than we do. I believe you guys are a little higher elevation. So certain varieties that do well here, especially in the perennial realm, um, like pomegranates. People talk to me about pomegranates a lot. Um, they grow very well here. They love the heat, but they do not like the cold. So if you're from any higher elevation, I don't usually recommend them. Um, but Tuba City is pretty close. And on this uh, handout here, um, it actually specifically lists Tuba City. Um, so Tuba City is a, is, uh, it gives you your own growing schedule for that area. Um, Alyssa added some great comment. Yes, for the soil, I added free manure from the stables. Yeah, a lot of ranchers will love it if you want to come and pick up their manure. Um, the one thing I'll caution on, yeah, put a tarp over the winter. Okay, Alyssa already hit it. Awesome. You go, girl. Um, is with, with fresh manure, you want to age it. So um, just you don't want to put fresh manure, chicken, steer, or any variety on your garden, you want to give that time to kind of uh, go down in uh, intensity, uh, give it time to break down so that you're not burning anything. Um, you're welcome, Victoria. Thank you. Any suggestions for shade setups that can withstand the page winds? Um, I definitely recommend, now honestly, the shade fabric at most stores, the fabrics itself is strong enough to handle the wind, but you really want to make sure you have some good support set up to hold them. Otherwise, you're going to end up with a big sale and it's just going to rip off of your posts. Um, mine goes right up against a um, lattice work. So that really helps kind of stabilize it. But I would just make sure that whatever you have that shade attached to is either posts that are pretty well sunk, um, rebar or T posts were great. Um, so that's a good one. How long do you water? Um, honestly, that kind of depends on how thirsty your soil is. 
Um, and when I say that, as you can usually tell when your soil is a little too dry because it absorbs the water really quickly. Um, so at that point, you might wanna do a longer water. If you notice you've got a lot of standing water in your garden, um, then you're probably getting a little bit too much saturation. Um, thank you. Can you grow Meyer lemons here? Excellent question. Okay, lemon citrus is one that I get a ton of questions on. Um, citrus love the sun, right? They're all over Phoenix, uh, Florida areas, but they do not like our cold weather here. Um, they are not a frost tolerant variety. Um, I do recommend um, using miniature varieties, dwarf varieties. I know a lot of people that have success with potted lemons. Um, they usually bring them outside for the summertime. They do great. They even get a lot of fruit that way. And then they bring them in the wintertime. It doesn't necessarily have to be inside your house. It can be inside a garage or something, just anywhere where you're gonna be able to keep the frost off. Um, last thing I'll touch on with that, cause I know we didn't really talk about fruit trees, um, but something with, oh, where'd my little tag go? Fruit trees to remember is, oh, there it is. Ah. Um, fruit trees don't really go so much by zones as they do by chill hours. Um, so with chill hours, I've got a little pixie peach. This is a miniature peach tree that I have in my backyard right now, and I love it. Um, this, the back of the tag says estimated winter chilling requirement, 400 hours below 45 degrees. Um, so especially being here in Arizona where we don't have a ton of winter freeze, um, you know, we have a lot longer warm season. Um, I suggest area um, selecting your fruit tree varieties with a relatively low chill hour requirement. Um, usually anywhere between, oh, four and 800 hours does okay. And that doesn't necessarily mean your plant is gonna die if you have something that has, doesn't have the correct chill hour requirements but it's definitely going to impact your harvest on how well those varieties produce. Mm -hmm. So that's a good one as well. All right, guys, do I have any other good questions? Ooh, that's a good one, Melissa, scales. And I know we're gonna go into um, pests in a later class, so I don't wanna touch too much on that, but there are a lot of common problems like that with scale borers, um, aphids, of course, are the bane of every vegetable gardener's existence. So um, I recommend if you do have your garden on like a drip system where, you know, you maybe don't need to be in there every day, still go in there, walk around, check underneath your leaves, especially because if you're going to get a bug problem, that's usually where it starts, um, is kind of on that other underside um, where they're hidden. So um, yeah, be prepared for that because of course, you just set up this beautiful buffet of, of vegetables and plants. So the bugs are going to come. The creatures are going to come because you just sort of in, inadvertently created a perfect environment for them. Water, food, shelter. Um, so really be on the lookout for those. Awesome. Any other questions? I know we're getting a little late, so I don't want to keep anybody up past their dinner slash bedtime. I know that's me. I'm a early to bed lady. Um, it's been a pleasure, guys. Really, thank you so much for uh, being an active class. I love uh, I love getting the questions on the fly. I appreciate you all so much, and it's nice to see some from for a little familiar faces here and uh, some new faces. I hope to see you guys again around town um, here locally. Welcome to town. Um, yeah, thank you guys so much. Feel free to reach out to me over at Ace Hardware. That's where I live. Um, and yeah, Gail, just awesome. Everything, everyone has been awesome. So thank you. Okay, well, thank you so much, Danielle. That was really great. You are definitely a really amazing resource there in Paige. I learned a lot from you. Because because I've never gardened in Page. Um, so thanks so much for volunteering to um, help us out tonight. If you all don't have any more questions, um, we can just end early. That's fine.
everybody good? All right, remember to keep track of your Zoom link and I will see you all next week. I'm looking forward to it. Awesome, thank you, Gail. See ya.